Welcome to Cubicle Talks. This is Zayda, writer, content editor, and your host. Cubicle Talks are a series where we get to have a warm cup of coffee and chat with the most successful people in their unique fields of business. In this series, these incredible people share their jaw-breaking expertise with us, and we bring them to you for your success. So grab yourself a warm cup of coffee or tea, and let's begin. At Cubicle Talks, today we have Suzanne Madsen. My take on her incredible journey has been that she develops astounding leaders, sits with teams, and helps kick off projects. She adds a brand new layer to executive coaching by facilitating leaders, leadership capabilities, and helps grow high-performing teams worldwide. So without further ado, let's listen to her interdimensional journey and her transition to coaching from financial services. Hello, Suzanne. We're so thrilled to have you with us today. I don't think I could cover everything in that shallow introduction. So could you tell us what is it that you do and what is the story behind it? Yeah, um, good morning. Thank you for having me. So yes, the story from, as you briefly said, going from financial services to being an independent coach. So my background is in project management and I have been, I had like 20 years of experience in running projects. I was a consultant. I was working in financial services, as, as you said, um, in technology, actually. So I was running big technology projects in finance. And back in 2008, I was invited to go on a leadership course with my, with the company who I work for. And as part of that leadership course, I was coached for the first time. That's awesome. And I had a complete aha moment. First realization was um, on me personally. I felt I was empowered. I felt I could make changes. You know, I came to the session with, I'm exhausted as a project manager. Help me. What can I do? And by somebody asking me questions, I realized that if I wanted to leave work at like 5 p.m. instead of 7 or 8 p.m., I could do it. There was no one holding me back. It sounds very simple. But actually, I realized that it was my own thinking holding me back. So it had an impact on my own style at work, on on my own well-being. Um, And then I had this realization that um, coaching is unbelievably powerful. What is this coaching thing? So I began to study coaching. And the other thing that happened in parallel after this leadership course was my other realization, which is project managers need leadership. You know, we're so task oriented, we need more leadership. So that's actually what's put me on this journey since 2008. I qualified as a coach in 2009. I began to write my first book. Then in 2013, I decided to actually um, leave corporate and and set up on my own. So what I do today and have done ever since is I coach project managers and I run leadership courses for project managers. And I also train some fundamental project management. That's wonderful. So up to this day, as you said, you've published two books. One of them is the Project Management Coaching Workbook, and the second one is The Power of Project Leadership, which has been recognized worldwide and even translated to Chinese and awarded PMI's Literature Award. How those experiences have been for you? It's been wonderful. And, you know, um, it's so rare that I get an opportunity to actually show my books. I don't think I've ever done it, uh, all of them together. So... I just thought it would be fun. Here's the Project Management Coaching Workbook. It's no longer in print, I don't think. I think it's just available in... um... So the idea behind my first book was that... And it's a coaching workbook, so people can can write in it and score themselves. And the idea was that for people who can't afford their own coach, I will coach them through how to become a better project manager. So it's a bit of a mix between coaching and mentoring, if you like. I use coaching techniques but I also give some advice, which is the difference between coaching and mentoring. And um, I felt I was walking a bit taller after I, I published that book. Of course, that's, that's left me long ago, but um, it's, um, it's more the leadership side. And the second edition came out um, three years later. So this is, I think, two years ago now. And that's the one I won the award for. And I even have the award with me here, PMI's. Award. I'm using it as a bookshelf uh, here. As Congratulations. A, as a holder. And feel, I feel good about it. But the e side, I feel, has kind of left me now. I, I, I just, it's just fun. It's fun to show it. 
and and makes me realize that quite a bit has happened but um i would advise anyone who has something to share to to put it down on paper to blog or to um to put it out there because i think that's what it's all about it's about adding value and giving something that other people can learn from exactly these are very insightful suggestions so thank you so um i'd like to talk about your field of expertise art of projects as you've written already two books about it let's say what do you think that are the fundamentals of a project well there's a lot to say i mean i do a whole i obviously teach in project management one of the most important things i think is to recognize that projects are about change so if we do something over and over again and we deliver the same thing it's not a project because there's nothing new to deliver so projects are fundamentally something unique about a project what does it mean it means that there is something about the project that we haven't done before even if um let's say in an organization people work with the same software package it's only a project if they're implementing if, if some of the requirements are new if it's a new customer and they need to tweak the product slightly differently then there is something unique about this project. What does it mean again? It means that there is something risky, something we haven't done before. And that's what project management is there to do. Project management is there to uh, manage that uncertainty, the, the, the new stuff that we haven't tried before, the risk. The bigger and more uncertain and new uh, a project is, the more control we need from project management. If you've done it more or less before, but it's a new customer, well, you need some project management control, but a lot of it is known. So you need less project management to, to, to control that uncertainty. That's beautiful. So I think that you're saying sometimes things get just too risky and out of control. How do you think we should manage these risks in project management environments? We used to have this view that project managers and I think I used to have that view as well. A good project manager is somebody who's a superman or superwoman who is in control of everything, mm -hmm. uh, identifies and analyzes and manages all the risks. But that's just part of the truth, because today we know that collaboration is much more powerful than just one individual project manager having control of everything. Uh, one project manager in today's world cannot everything. It's not possible. We need to empower the team. So, uh, and, and the collaboration tools that we have in project management are helping us with that. So back to risk management, one of the uh, most important things is to do it with the team. So ask the team, what could go wrong? What do we worry about? And, and, and log it, write it down and regularly reviewing it with the team. It could be once every two weeks even, or once every week, if it's a very dynamic project. What are the new risks? What are coming up? What's happening over here? What, are, what is happening for you? Um, not so much what is blocking you right now, because that's an issue, but risks are potential issues for the future that we can't do something about today. And another thing that many project managers um, get wrong when they look about risks is that they assign themselves as the owner to everything. But they're not the owner. I mean, the whole we have a whole team. We have stakeholders. We have management. So the most appropriate person should own the risk, meaning do something about it to mitigate it. So a risk must always have an owner, but it doesn't have to be the project manager. That's true. But it's, uh, isn't it also effective to plan these milestones with clear ownership? So do you think that the entire team uh, should have that ownership? How do we set it clear? Like, how do we have uh, or make the team have the uh, embrace the ownership of the entire project? I mean, ownership is a huge, huge topic. I think that's probably the most challenging of all on a project. The project manager feels, oh, it's all on my show. A dilemma, because the more, the more, well, it's not a dilemma, but it, it, it's interesting because the more control I ship. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. If I don't feel my team is taking enough ownership, I have to really uh, put it on the table and, and look at why that is and, and really get to the bottom of it. It's not simple, but you mentioned milestone planning. Yeah. And it is with milestone planning as with risk management, it's better, to, it's better done collaboratively. So one of the things I blog about, people can look up my blog and my video on it. I have a lot of short videos on YouTube, is 
um, how to create a collaborative milestone plan. And I also, by the way, have a video on how to, the team is together physically. They can get in a room, they can brainstorm, and I have posters everywhere. I just love posted notes. Um, they can brainstorm on posted notes, put it on a whiteboard. Um, so it's tasks and activities and, and, and out of that, out of that whole board of things that need to get done, they can collectively say, okay, out of all of this, what are the 10 to 12 or 15 major milestones for the project? So a milestone, of course, doesn't have any duration. A milestone is, uh, signifies the end of a number of activities. So it could be end of definition phase, or it is a milestone, or it could be that um, end of prototyping, prototyping done is a milestone. Or So if the team agrees on what are these 10, 12, 15 milestones, that we want to track throughout the project. We can list them in an Excel sheet. Uh, that's the most basic. With an owner, with a date, and then we can use that to track. So it's, it's a high level plan. It's not detailed enough plan for the team, but it is um, a plan that is detailed enough for the executive. So it becomes a really good way to report progress of the project upwards to the senior management. So. Um, I have um, on my website also a milestone um, template that people can download. That's wonderful. So, and sorry to interrupt, uh, sure. just one other thing. The fact that the team does this collaboratively, that is what creates the ownership. Because if you have skin in the game, as we say, then you're actually more, um, then you're more bought into it. So there's a piece of you invested in it because I have been part of it. So then I feel accountable for it also. That's true. But don't you think that um, the team also should have self-confidence while doing that? As the pandemic also showed us and made us all introverts, we uh, saw it again and again, how important it is to do it confidently, being confident of our skills and abilities, especially in the workplace because I think it adds another layer and strengthens our existing skills. So how do you think we can be more confident as project management, uh, managers and team members in the workplace? Yeah, systems that I coach project managers on, we think it's just us feeling not confident, but there are many people out there feeling not so confident, especially if we're more junior, because project managers are in a position where they have to work with experts, senior leaders who have much more experience than them. And it can be very intimidating. So how do we gain more confidence? Well, experience gives us to us in what we're doing. We will also feel more confident. We can feel more competent through experience, working on more projects and through training, not just the hard skills training, how to, how to create a milestone plan, but also the soft skills training is very important. How do I have challenging conversation? You know, the elephant in the room. Nobody, we don't like that. None of us like that. But if we can learn to do that, that would give us enormous strength and confidence. Uh, that's not easy to get to. That's a maturity thing as well. So we can work with a mentor. We can work with a coach. We can um, shadow a more seen the same organ and use that person perhaps as a, a kind of a mentor if, if, if it works out. It's, none of this is easy to do. Well, it's easy to do, but we have to uh, actually be proactive and seek it out. So that can help. There's no, there's no quick fix yeah. to confidence, but it, um, it is an important point. That's true. As you said, uh, part of managers uh, as a life, you know, they have to be confident of themselves, their abilities, their management skills, leadership. And when it comes to leadership, as you said, there is not really a quick fix. And we wish them the best. And with your insights, hopefully, they're going to get better at it. Thank you. So you've written an article at Project Cubicle. What do you do when you feel out of depth on a project? Would you like to talk about it? No, I think people can 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 look it up. You know, it's um, I think it has several dimensions to it. On mm -hmm. um, some some, it has specific advice on what to do. There's something about what are the reasons why we might feel out of depth and what can we do to address it, both our level of thinking and practical steps we can put in place on the project. That's true. So we have a question to you. In project management, 
Do you think, is it possible to be too cautious? What do you think would be the results of being overly cautious in the workplace? Would it end us in the project management manager being uh, paranoid or anything else? Would it hurt the project? You know, a lot of what I um, write about and what's also in, in um, something I, I, I have a whole section on in, in, in the power of project leadership is the yin and yang. So everything we do in a project and, and actually in life is about yin and yang. So the way I use it in this context is that yin, if we're very yin, we're very, as leaders, as project managers, we're very supportive, we are very nurturing, we listen well, we, uh, we are good at working with the team. So we're very, very supportive, basically. The yang is opposite. The yang is very demanding. We've got to deliver this, and these are the standards, and it's very tough and challenging. And so the, the most effective way to be a leader and a project manager is to be both. We've got to be challenging because we have a project to deliver. You know, this, this is not about just having a, a great team and having fun. A, a great team is only a great team if they deliver what we need to deliver. So that's the yang side. That's the challenging side. But if we're only challenging, it creates a lot of stress for the project team. So at the same time, we need to also be supportive and nurturing and yin. And so it's the two that go together. If I'm only yin, if I'm only supportive and listening, but I forget about our goals, that's obviously not effective. And it's, it's definitely not motivating either because we're not going anywhere. So I don't know if that speaks to your question. Uh, that's what I would. That's what I would say. Is it's about the balancing act. That's true. Uh, when you said balancing, um, I also would like to emphasize another point: slowing down, which another thing uh, pandemic proved us that it's important. So why do you think um, when we need to balance the project stages? and the crucial points and milestones, and sometimes things get too risky and stressed. So why should we slow down? And how should we slow down when that happens? So projects are typically very hectic and it's like the world is speeding up. Everything is going faster and faster and faster. There's more pressure on teams, uh, unbelievable amount of pressure on teams actually. Slowing down to intuitive. Well, why can I slow down? I have so much to do. And I wouldn't say it's a general thing to slow down all the time, but it's taking out moments in our busy day, busy week to say time out. Time out. Let's, let's, let me observe what is going on instead of doing, doing, doing. When I'm in the flood, just doing, mm -hmm. I can't see. I'm just in it. So I've got to take a step back, slow down, take a step back and look, look around me okay, are we working the most effective way? Where are we headed? What's the dynamic in the team like? What's our relationship with the client like? When we are just doing, 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 delivering, 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 holding meetings, being in, in, in 110 miles an hour, we don't have the capacity or the time or the mental space to ask these reflective questions. So it's crucial for any leader or manager who wants to better themselves, who wants to do something smarter today than we did yesterday to take this time out, this pause on a regular basis. It could be once a week on a Friday afternoon when things are a little bit slower or to go somewhere else to just shut down the phone for, for an hour and reflect. And the other reason why it's good to actually um, slow down is for obviously for our health. That's a slightly different point, which is if I get very stressed on my project, if I get very triggered by a, a team member or, or something a stakeholder has said, if I am too reactive, I'm not making the best decisions in the brain. I'm, we're not making the best decisions if we're firefighting. So again, slowing down, gaining control of my heart rate and of my physiology, I'm better able to gather my thoughts in a constructive way instead of just reacting. That can only come if I also slow down. So uh, there are many benefits. True. So I have two points to emphasize in what you said. The first one is you said that um, it's important to just look and observe. 
um, what is really happening? Is it everything working clearly? How is the team dynamic? So um, I think at, in project management, for this reason, we need to be objective about it. Like if we are biased about the projects, say that we uh, have a personal connection to our team members or the project is too deep for us. Um, it sometimes gets too um, difficult to be objective about the project. So how do we um, ask for feedback when that happens? Who do we ask for feedback? Feedback is an important, is one of the most important things we can do actually if we want to better ourselves. Because think about it, if you have a jar, let's say, uh, or a bottle and you have a label on it, for us, we're inside the bottle. You know, we can't, you can't read the label from the inside. We can't. So somehow we've got to ask for a perspective from outside who can read that label, who can give us some feedback because we're not able to see ourselves from outside. And this is not about pleasing everybody because if you ask 10 people for feedback, you're going to get 10 different opinions. And if you try to satisfy everybody, you're going to get more stressed. So that's also not good. What is good is when we ask for feedback to listen to some of the commonalities that people are saying and take that on board. So I will start very gentle with feedback. I think you don't just ask feedback out of the blue. You need to establish a relationship with people, build trust with people. And, and I would say only ask for feedback from people whose opinions you respect. So if you're working for a manager who you just hate, you're never going to listen to his feedback and take it on board. So ask for people's feedback who you generally think are, you know, you would listen to them. And one thing you can do that is just to say, if it's personal feedback, for instance, you can ask, what, um, what should I stop doing? What should I start doing? And what should I continue to do? You can ask, um, what do you worry about on the project? Is there anything you think we should be doing differently? So you're not asking what I should be doing differently as a project manager. You're asking, is there anything you think we should be doing differently on the project? More like a collaborative approach on that as well. That's yeah, great. everything is collaboration. You know, we have to get away from this idea that as a project manager, I've got to have all the answers and I need to be in control of everything. Mm -hmm. It's tempting to have the superhero project but it's also very limiting. It's more powerful if we open up and expand and invite every, everybody's views in and everybody's expertise in. That's true. So as you said, it's not really easy to be a project manager and they're not really a superhero and they have all this weight on their shoulders, but how do they develop themselves as project managers? For example, how did you grow yourself as a project manager? Did you have a mentor or someone you could talk about to about your skills and get objective feedback about what you should be doing and what you should not be doing? You know, it's an interesting question because um, when I worked in some of the organizations, my manager told me, you have the black belt in project management and people would come to me for advice. I didn't feel I had anybody else that I could ask for advice. So I didn't really have a manager like a, 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 a a, a mentor like that. I think what I did was sometimes I, I asked myself, I had, a, I had a dilemma, I had a problem. And that actually helped me to get another perspective, like a more wise, wise perspective in. But I didn't have anybody. I had a great, great manager who really supported me and believed in me and, and, and let me get on with it. But I didn't have a project management uh, mentor. I, I often wish I had. And today it is because we're talking 20 years ago. So today is much easier for people because we have we can Google everything and we can Google. You know, I get a lot of requests online from people who want to be coached by me who, who found me. So um, that is helping people. That's true. And your website is incredibly insightful, by the way, when it comes to resources or your blog articles. You are amazing on that context. And we are going to leave all those links for you to read and get benefit from that as well. So um, what would be your final suggestions to project managers who are just starting to, uh, you know, uh, we're seeing what is project management and trying to understand um, 
what really is it? You know, we know it's not about being a superhero and we know that it's uh, about collaborating with our team members. It's about accepting that we can make mistakes in the workplace and setting milestones, but um, it can get pretty confusing as a noble project manager. So what would be your suggestion to them? I think we would have to mention some of the things we touched upon already. Um, so how, how, how do you get confidence? It's from being, being more competent and getting some training. So the first point I think is to get some training. Now, I, um, I don't know how much people who are listening to this are familiar with PRINCE2, but PRINCE2 is one of the certifications you can take amongst some others. There's also PMP, which is from the PMI, which is an American organization. PRINCE2 is a, Europe uh, is um, a UK organization. Then there's the APM, which is also from here, from Europe. Um, and there's the IPMA, which is the International Project Management Association. So there's a number of different certifications that people can take. They're quite big, they're quite heavy, and they're good. And I would say if you are just starting out as a project manager and you begin something big like that, just be careful that you don't drown in it because it's very demanding and you, you, you don't want it to put you down. You want to learn from it. So if you're doing it, that's great. They've done all the certifications, but they still don't understand projects because these big certifications are more about you know process. So my advice might be to people, start with something very tangible, very um, almost like project management for dummies, you know, but something that is um, simple to understand, simple to learn. You can look at some of the many videos I have online or something which is just start slow and get the basics right. Somebody who can teach you with some humor and it's not, you know, just to get the basics of projects. And then you can do the big certifications later. There's a lot of resources out there that, that can help people. You also have free project management resources on your website, and they're incredible, um, which we'll again leave you uh, in the description below. Leave those every, uh, each and every link of them. I'm super excited of them because they're super insightful and they're a complete gem because uh, they're built with your years of expertise and tacit knowledge in the work field. And I've known about it for a week now, yet I feel there is still incredibly much to discover and learn from your website. And especially the video you have where you welcome us and greet us into your website and tell us all about it is super genuine. And then we feel that we can trust you in this. And I personally feel that I can especially trust you uh, with this project management and coaching and leadership I felt like I've been speaking to a mentor, even. That's the oh, feeling that's nice. I have. Yeah. Well, I decided to, I set up the website a long time ago. And because I have my books, it's it's been easy to take some resources and put online. And there was a point when I had people register to get to the resources page, but I just got tired of it. I mean, I just took it all out. So now it's just available for everybody. I mean, it was always free, but I had people register with their name. But maintaining a big mailing list, I, I didn't, you know, why did I have to pay money to maintain a big business? <laughs> you know, so I actually deleted it all. So now I don't know how many people are, are using the resource. I don't know who is there, but it's it's a contribution. So it's my way of contributing and just making it available. I must say, though, for people just to access the resources won't make you a better project manager, but it's going to give you something in the toolbox. So you still need some training, I, I think, or some somebody who you can work with. That's true. Suzanne, it was a real pleasure to have you with us in Cubicle Talk today. So thank you so much for your time and your beneficial insight for us today. And I believe that Project Cubicle leaders will greatly benefit from them. So do you have any final words for us? No, just, um, you know, thank you for this interview and for everybody listening. I would say good luck with your projects. There is help out there. Don't despair. It's normal that is tough, it's absolutely normal. Uh, don't worry, just breathe deeply and um, projects are amazing because yeah, if you find an area you, you're interested in, you can, you can really make a difference. The, the, world is, the world is made up of projects now, it's change, that's what happens. So stick with it and good luck. Thank you so much. So we'll see you again at Cubicle Talks sometime, I hope in the future again, because you are incredibly a person with expertise and we feel that we'll see you again in the future. 
So thank you so much again. And we'll see you again at Cubicle Talks sometime soon. You're welcome. Have a nice day.